Large language models have a little bit of an issue with data freshness. That is the ability to use data that is actually up to date. Now, that is because the world according to a large language model is essentially frozen in time. The large language model understands the world as it was in its training data set. And the training data set, it's huge, it contains a ton of information, but you're not going to retrain a large language model on new training data sets very often because it's expensive, it takes a ton of time, and it's, you know, it's just not very easy to do. So how do we handle that problem? Well, for that, for keeping data up to date in a large language model, we can use retrieval augmentation. The idea behind this technique is that we retrieve relevant information from what we call a knowledge base, and we will actually pass that into our large language model, but not through training, but through the prompt that we're, we're feeding into the model. That makes this external knowledge base our window into the world or into the specific subset of the world that we would like our large language model to have access to. In this video, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to have a look at how we can implement a retrieval augmentation pipeline using LangChain. So before we jump into it, it's probably best we understand that there are different types of knowledge that we can feed into a large language model. We're going to be talking about parametric knowledge and source knowledge. Now, the parametric knowledge is actually gained by the LLM during its training, okay? So we have a big training process and within that training process, the LLM creates like an internal representation of the world according to that training data set. And they all get stored within the parameters of the large language model. Okay, and it can store a ton of information there because they're super big. But of course, this is pretty static. After training, the parametric knowledge is set and it doesn't change. And that's where source knowledge comes in. So when we are feeding a, a query, or a prompt into our LLM. Okay, so we have some prompts, and it was a question. We feed that into the LLM, and then it's going to return us like an answer based on that prompt. But this input here, this is what we would call the source knowledge. Okay, so source knowledge, and then up here we have the parametric knowledge. Now, when we're talking about retrieval augmentation, naturally what we're going to be doing is adding more knowledge via the source knowledge to the LLM. We're not touching the parametric knowledge. Okay, so we're gonna start with this notebook. There'll be a link to this uh, somewhere in the top of the video right now. And the first thing we're gonna do is actually build our knowledge base. So this is going to be the location where we saw all of that source knowledge that we will be feeding or potentially feeding into our large language model at inference time. So when we're making the, the predictions or generating text. So we're gonna be using the Wikipedia data set from here. So this is from Hugging Face data sets. And we'll just have a quick look at one of those examples. Okay, so if we go across, we have all this text here. This is what we're going to be putting into our knowledge base. And you can see that it's pretty long, right? It, yeah, it goes on for quite a while. So there's a bit of an issue here. A large language model and also the uh, encoding model that we're going to be using as well, they have a limited amount of text that they can efficiently process. And they also have like a, a ceiling where they, they can't process anymore and will return an error. But more importantly, we have that sort of efficiency threshold. We don't want to be feeding too much text into an embedding model because usually the embeddings are of lesser quality when we do that. And we also don't want to be feeding too much text into our completion model. So this is the model that's generating an answer because the performance of that. So if you, for example, give it some instructions and you feed in a small amount of extra text after those instructions, there's a good chance you're going to follow those instructions. If we put in the instructions and then loads of text, there's actually an increased 
chance that the model will forget to follow these instructions. So both the embedding and the completion quality degrades with the more text that we feed into those models. So what we need to do here is actually cut down this long chunk of text into smaller chunks. So to create these chunks, we first need a way of actually measuring the length of our text. Now we can't just count the number of words or count the number of characters because a, a language model, that's not how they count the length of text. They count the length of text using something called a, a token. Now token is typically like a word or subword length uh, chunk of or, or string and it actually varies by like, language model or, or just language model and the tokenizer that they use. Now for us we're going to be using the GPT 3.5 turbo model and the encoding model for that is actually this one here. Okay so I mean we can maybe I can show you how we how we can check for that so we import tick token so tick token is just the tokenizer or the family of tokenizers that OpenAI AI uses for a lot of their large language models, all of the GPT models. So what we are going to do is we're going to say um, tick token dot encoding for model. And then we just pass in the name of the model that we're going to be using. So GPT 3.5 turbo. Okay. And actually the, the, embedding model that we should be using is this one okay cool so lucky we checked let's run that uh, in reality that there is very little difference between like this tokenizer and the the p50 tokenizer that we saw before so in reality the difference is is pretty minor um, but anyway so we can take a look here and we see that the tokenizer split this into 26 tokens right and if we let me take this and what we'll do is we'll just split it by spaces and i just want to actually get the length of that list as well right so this is the number of words right and i just want to show you that there's not a direct mapping between the number of tokens and the number of words and obviously not for the number of characters either. Okay, so the number of tokens is not exactly the number of words. Cool, so we move on. And now that we have this, this function here, which is it's just counting the number of tokens within some text that we pass to it, we can actually initialize what we call a text splitter. Now, text splitter just allows us to take, you know, a long chunk of text like this and split it into chunks and we can specify that chunk size. So we're going to say we don't want anything longer than 400 tokens. We're going to also add an overlap between chunks. So uh, you, you imagine, right, we're going to split into 400, roughly 400 um, token length chunks. At the end of one of those chunks and the beginning of the next chunk, we might actually be splitting it in the middle of a sentence or in, in between sentences that are related to each other. So that means that we might cut out some important information, like connecting information between two chunks. So what we do to somewhat avoid this is we add a chunk overlap, which says, okay, for, I don't know, chunk zero and chunk one between them there's actually an overlap of about 20 tokens that is exists within both of those uh, this just reduces the chance of us cutting out something or a connection between two chunks that is actually like important information okay uh the length function so this is what we created before up here and then we also have separators so separators is it's gonna so this what we're using here is a recursive character text splitter. It's going to say, try and split on double new line characters first. If you can't split on new line character, if not split on a space, if not split on anything. Okay. That's all that is. And yeah, so we can run that and we'll get these smaller chunks. It's still pretty long, but as we can see here, they are now all under 400 uh, tokens. So that's pretty useful.
Now, what we want to do is actually move on to creating the embeddings for this whole thing. So the embeddings or, or vector embeddings are a very key component of this whole retrieval thing that we're about to do. And essentially they will allow us to just retrieve relevant information that we can then pass to our large language model based on like a, a user's query. So what we're going to do is take each of the chunks that we're going to be creating and embedding them into essentially what are just vectors, okay? But these vectors are not, not just normal vectors, they're actually, you can think of them as being numerical representations of the meaning behind whatever text is within that chunk. And the reason that we can do that is because we're using a, a specially trained embedding model that essentially translates human readable text into machine readable embedding vectors. So once we have those embeddings, we then go and sort those in our vector database, which we'll be talking about pretty soon. And then when we have a user's query, we encode that using the same embedding model and then just compare those vectors within that vector space and find the items that are the most similar in terms of like their, basically their angular similarity, if that makes sense. Uh, or you can, another alternative way that you could think of it is their distance within the vector space. Although that's not exactly right because it's actually the, the angular similarity between them, but it's pretty similar. So we're gonna come down to here and I'm just going to first add my OpenAI API key. And one thing I should know is obviously you're gonna, you would be paying for this. And also actually, if you don't have your API key, so it's, sorry, it's platform, it's openai.com, okay? And then what we're going to need to do is initialize this text embedding order 002 model. Uh, so this is basically OpenAI's best embedding model at the time of recording this. So we'd go ahead and we would initialize that via Langchain using the OpenAI embeddings object, okay? Then with that, we can just encode text uh, like this. So we have this list of chunks of text and then we just do embed, so the embedding model embed documents and then pass in a list of our of our text chunks there. Okay, then we can see, so the response we get from this, okay, so the, what we're returning is we get two vector embeddings and that's because we have two chunks of text here. And each one of those has this dimensionality of 1,536. This is just the embedding dimensionality of the uh, text embedding R002 model each embedding model is going to vary. This exact number is not typical, but it's within the range of what would be an, a, a typical uh, dimensionality for these embedding models. Okay, cool. So with that, we can actually move on to the vector database part of things. So a vector database is a specific type of knowledge base that allows us to search using these embedding vectors that we've created and actually scale that to billions of records. So we could we could literally have well billions of these these text chunks in there that we encode into vectors and we can search through those and actually return them uh, very, very quickly. We're talking like I think a billion scale you maybe you're looking at 100 milliseconds, maybe even less if you're optimizing it. Now, because it's a database that we're gonna be using, we can also manage our records so we can you know, add, update, delete records, which is super important for that uh, data freshness thing that I mentioned earlier. And we can even do some things like uh, what, what we'd call metadata filtering. So if I use the example of internal company documents. Let's say you have company documents that belong to engineering, company documents that belong to HR. Uh, you could use this metadata filtering to filter purely for you know, HR documents or engineering documents. So that's where you would start using that. Uh, you can also filter based on dates and all these other things as well. So let's take a look at how we'd initialize that. So to create the vector database, uh, we're gonna be using Pinecone for this. You do need a free API key from Pinecone. 
there may be a wait list at the moment for that but you know at least at the time of at the time of recording i think that wait list is being processed pretty quickly so hopefully would not be waiting too long so i'm going to just well first i'll get my api key and i'll get my environment so i've gone to app.pinecone.io you'll end up in your default project by default and then you go to api keys you click copy right and also just note your environment here okay so i have us west one gcp so i'm going to remember that and I'll, I'll type that in okay so let me run this enter my api key and now i'm going to enter my environment which is us west one gcp okay so i'm just getting an error because i've already created the the index here so let me what i can do is just add another uh, line here so if index name kind of want to do that not quite so i don't want to delete it if index name is not in the index list we're, we're going to create it otherwise I'm, i don't need to create it because it's already there so i'm, I'm not going to create it because i don't need to uh, but of course, when you run this, if this is your first time running this notebook, it will create that index. Uh, then after that, we need to connect to the index. Uh, we're using this gRPC index, which is just an alternative to using index. Uh, gRPC is just a little more reliable, it can be faster. So I, I like to use that one uh, instead. But you can, you can use either, honestly. It doesn't make a huge difference. Okay, and Again, if you're running this for the first time, this is going to say zero, okay? Because it will be an empty index. For me, obviously, there's already vectors in there. So uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're already there. And then what we would, we would do is we'd start populating uh, the index. I'm not gonna run this again because I've, I've already run it, but let me take you through what is actually happening. So we set first set this batch limit. Uh, so this is saying, okay, I don't want to upsert or add any more than 100 records at any one time. Now, that's important for two reasons, really, more than anything else. First, the API request to OpenAI, and you can only send and receive so much data. And then the API request to Pinecone uh, for the exact same reason, you can only send so much data. So we limit that so we don't go beyond where we would likely hit a data limit and then we initialize this text list and also this metadata list and then we're going to go through we're going to create our metadata we're going to get our text and we're using the, the split text method there and then we just create our metadata so the, the metadata is just the metadata we created up here plus the, the trunk that we so this is like the chunk number so imagine for each record like the alan turing example earlier on we had three chunks from that single record so in that case we would have chunk zero chunk one chunk two and then we would have the corresponding text for each one of those chunks and then the metadata is actually on the article level so that wouldn't vary for each chunk okay so it's just the, the chunk number and the text that will actually vary there. Okay, uh, we uh, append those to our current batches, which is up here. And then we say, once we reach our batch limit, then we would add everything. Okay, so that, that's what we're doing there. And then actually, so here, so we might actually get to the end here and we'll probably have a few left over. So we should also catch those as well. So we would say, if the length of text is greater than, yeah, we would do this. Okay, so that's just to catch those final, let's say we have like three items at the end there uh, with that, the initial code, they would have been missed. Okay, and we don't wanna miss anything. So yeah, um, we create our IDs, we're using UUID4 for that, uh, and then we, create our embeddings with embed embed documents. This is just what we did before. We then add everything to our Pinecone index. So that includes 
basically the way that we do that is we'll create a list or an iterable object that contains tuples of IDs, uh, embeddings, and metadata. And yeah, that's it. Okay, so after that we will have indexed everything. Of course, I already had everything in there, so this isn't varied. This doesn't change, but for you it should say something. It should say like 27.4-ish thousand. And yeah, so that is our indexing process. So we just added everything to our knowledge base or added all the source knowledge to our knowledge base. And then what we want to do is actually back in line chain, we're going to initialize a new Pinecone instance. So the Pinecone instance that we just created was not within line chain. The reason that I did that is because uh, creating the index and populating it in line chain is a fair bit slower than just doing it directly with the Pinecone client. So I, I tend to avoid doing that. Maybe at some point in the future that that will be optimized a little better than it is now. But for now, it's yeah, it isn't. So I avoid doing that part within line chain. But we are going to be using Langchain and actually for the next, so for the querying and for the retrieval augmentation with a large language model, Langchain makes this much easier. Okay, so I'm going to reinitialize Pinecone, but in Langchain. Now, as far as I, this might change, but the gRPC index wasn't recognized by Langchain last time I last time I tried. So we just use a normal index here. And yeah, we just initialize our VEX store. Okay, so this is a VEX database connection. Essentially the same as what we had up here, the index. Okay, and the only thing, the only extra thing we need to do here is we need to tell Langchain where the text within our metadata is stored. So it's it's a so we're saying the text field is text. And we can see that because we create it here. Okay, cool. So we run that. And then what we can do is we do a similarity search across that vector store. Okay, so we pass in our query. We're going to say who was Benito Mussolini. Okay, and we're going to return the top three most relevant docs to, our, to that query. And we see, okay, page content, Benito, Mussolini, so on and so on, Italian politician and, and journalist, prime minister of Italy, so on and so on, leader of the National Fascist Party. Okay, obviously relevant. And then this one, again, you know, it's clearly, I think clearly relevant and obviously <laughs> relevant again. So we're getting three relevant documents there. Okay, now, what can we do that? It's, it's a lot of information, right? If, uh, if we scroll across, that's a ton of text and we don't really, or at least I don't want to feed all that information to our users. So uh, what we want to do is actually come down to here and we're going to layer a large language model on top of what we just did. So that retrieval thing we just did, we're actually going to add a large language model onto the end of that. And it's essentially going to take the query, it's going to take these contexts, these documents that we returned, and it is going to, um, we're going to put them both together into the prompt, ask, and then ask the large language model to answer the query based on those returned documents or, or contexts. Okay, and we would call this generative question answering, and I mean, let's just see how it works, right? So we're going to initialize our LLM. We're using the GPT 3.5 Turbo model. Uh, temperature we set it to zero, so we basically decrease the randomness in the model generation as much as possible. That's important when we're trying to do like factual question answering because we don't really want the model to make anything up. It doesn't protect us 100% from it making things up, but it, it will limit it a bit more than if we set a high temperature. And then we actually use this retrieval QA chain. So the retrieval QA chain is just going to wrap everything up into a single function, okay? So it's going to give an query, it's gonna send it to our VEX database, retrieve everything, and then pass the query and the retrieved documents into the large language model and get it to answer the question for us. Okay, 
I should run this. And then I run this. And this can take a little bit of time. This is one, my bad internet connection, and also just the slowness of interacting with OpenAI um, at the moment. So we get Benito Mussolini, who was an Italian politician and journalist who served as Prime Minister of Italy. He was leader of the National Fascist Party and invented the ideology of fascism. He was a dictator of Italy by the end of 1927 in his form of fascism, Italian fascism, so on and so on, right? There's a ton of text in there, okay? And uh, I mean, it looks pretty accurate, right? But you know, large language models, they're very good at saying things that are completely wrong in a very convincing way. And that, that's actually one of the biggest problems with these. Like you don't necessarily know that what it's telling you is true. And of course, like for, for people that use these things a lot, they are pretty aware of this and they're probably going to cross check things. But you know, even for me, I use these all the time. Sometimes a large language model will say something and I'm kind of unsure like, oh, is that true? Is it not? I don't know. And then I have to check and it turns out that it's, it's just completely false. So that is problematic, especially when you start deploying this to users that are not necessarily using these sort of models all the time. So there's not a 100% full solution for that problem, for the, the issue of hallucinations. But we can do things to limit it. Um, on one, one end, we can use uh, prompt engineering to reduce the likelihood of the model making things up. We can set the temperature to zero to reduce the likelihood of the model making things up. Another thing we can do, which is, is not really you know, modifying the model at all, but it's actually just giving the, the user um, citations so they can actually check where this information is coming from. So to do that in, in Langchain, it's actually really easy. We just use a slightly different version of the Retrieval QA chain called the Retrieval QA with Sources chain. Okay, and then we use it in pretty much the same way. So we're just gonna, we're gonna pass the same query about uh, Benito Mussolini, you can see it here actually, and we're just gonna run that. Okay, so let's wait a moment. Okay, and yeah, I mean, we're getting the, pretty much the same, in fact, I think it's the same answer. And uh, what we can see is we actually get the sources of this information as well. So we can actually, I think we can click on this and yeah, it's gonna take us through and we can see, ah, okay. So this looks like a pretty uh, good source. Maybe this is a bit more trustworthy and we can also just use this as essentially a, a check. Uh, we can go through what we're reading and if something seems so weird, we can check on here to actually see that, you know, it's either true, like it's actually there or it's not. So yeah, that can be really useful. Simply just adding the source of our information, uh, it can make a big difference and really, I think, help users trust the system that we're building and even just as developers and also you know people like managers that are wanting to integrate these systems into their operations having those sources can i think make a big difference in trustworthiness so we've learned how to ground our large language models uh, using source knowledge so source knowledge again is the knowledge that we're feeding into the large language model via the the input prompt and naturally by doing this we're kind of you know we're encouraging accuracy in our in our large language model outputs and just reducing the likelihood of hallucinations or inaccurate information in there now as well we can obviously keep information super up to date with this with this approach and we saw at the end there with sources we can actually cite everything uh, which can be super helpful in trusting the output of these models now we're already seeing large language models being used with external knowledge bases in a lot of really big products like Bing AI, uh, Google's Bard, we see uh, ChatGPT plugins are you know, starting to use 
this sort of thing as well. So I think the future of large language models, these knowledge bases are going to be incredibly important. They are essentially an efficient form of memory for these models that we can, we can update and manage, uh, which we just can't do with if we just rely on parametric knowledge. So yeah, I really think that this like long-term memory for large language models is super important. It's, it's here to say, and it's definitely worth looking at whatever you're building at the moment and thinking, okay, does it make sense to integrate something like this? Uh, will it help, right? But for now, that's it for this video. So I hope, I hope this has been useful and interesting. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you again in the next one. Bye.